Christianity. But the problem is we don't stay in a constant pursuit of Jesus and we get distracted. We get caught up on things or people or personalities or church or building, all of the external things. But can I tell you, the only thing that you are required to do is to pursue God with all of your heart. It is not the pastor's job. It is not the worship leader's job. It is no one else's job. That is your responsibility to go after God and receive everything he has for you in this life. Amen. You can't put that on nobody. That's on you. Amen. And God has given us the grace. He's given us the time. He's given us the Holy Spirit. He's given us his, his son that all we have to do is come to him every day and say, Lord, here I am. What it is that you desire for me to do, I freely give myself to you. Amen. Because God is looking for willing hearts. Yeah. You know, one of the secrets to being used of God is your, your ability to understand this one fact. That if you're not willing to make a fool of yourself, God can't use you. Because you're still alive. The I has to die. You have to die. You have to come to the point to where I don't care who's looking at me. I don't care what's going to happen. I don't care the outcome. I'm going to step out for Christ. I'm going to be bold. I'm going to proclaim whatever it is that God has destined me to do. And I'm going to pr proclaim it with courage. Everyone say courage. Do I have any courageous people in the house this morning? Because you have to step out. I remember uh, Pastor Connor, when, when I was in the world, I grew up in church, but I wasn't always saved. I was one of those PK kids who, we, we, my mom put us in sports, so we had to play a team sport. It was, this was like a house protocol. Me, my brother and sister, we played sports, we learned a musical instrument, and then we were always in church. So my life was always church. Wednesday, Bible study, Sunday night. Mom, I got to do homework. Do it in the car. Get on the pew. Do your homework. In the we grew up in church, and it was good. My mother made us pray every single day. We came into the house. She said, we're going to pray. If you have to say one prayer, we're all going to take turns praying. And we did this for 18 years. And can I tell you, the devil is scared of a mother who prays for her children. Because what happens, those prayers eventually catch up. So if you're a mother, grandmama, I don't care, don't stop praying for your children. Because it's just a matter of moment before they break in and God begins to manifest that promise. So we grew up in church, we grew up in this space, and, and when I was 18, I went to the military, and I was so glad to be away from my parents, praise God. Because when you're the youngest, sometimes they don't let you do nothing. And so when I'm in the military, I moved to Virginia, Norfolk, Virginia. It's a naval base there. And immediately, I begin to move in rebellion. Yeah. And I said, man, everything that mom and dad said I couldn't do, now I'm about to do it. Where the club at? Where the alcohol at? Where the weed at? Let's, it's time for me to live. Here it is, church kid. All I knew is church. Now I'm dabbling in a world I have no, no idea. I'm in the club, don't know how to dress, don't know how to do anything, trying to talk to women in the club. And my friends are looking at me like, bro, what are you doing? You look funny. Do you know how to talk to women? I mean, I mean it was so bad. They said, man, you can't hang with us. You, you're killing our style. You know, and I hung around a lot of people from New York and New Jersey. And how many know people from the East Coast, they're a little bit more edgier. They're a little bit more aggressive. And so, you know, they was like, nah, you can't roll with us. And, and I said, no, 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 I, 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 I can't. Come on, let, let's go out some more. And I had to literally had to learn how to live in the world. Because I was so unaware of that whole culture of the world and secularism. And so as I learned, I began to get deeper and deeper and deeper in rebellion. Can I tell you, that's the spirit in the land, yeah. the spirit of rebellion, rebelling against God's will, rebelling against his purpose, rebelling this spirit of I want to do what I want to do. I don't want to submit to authority. I don't want to su su submit to a power greater than me. So I'm going to not only create my own God, but I might eventually become my own God. It's a spirit of harlotry. Everyone say spirit of harlotry. 
You guys know what a spirit of harlotry is? When you read the book of Hosea, it talks about the spirit of harlotry. It's basically defined as you forsaking the one true God and you putting something in its place and now it's creating idolatry. And what is the definition of an idol? An idol is anything you do more than God, that's an idol. And can I tell you, that is the biggest problem we're dealing with in America. Idolatry. Worshipping themselves. People worshipping their cars. People worshipping their possessions. Their jobs. Their beauty. Who they are. Their brand. All of these things that clearly is idolatry. Taking the place of God in their life and causing them to bound themselves and worship. And how many know that what you worship, you eventually conform to? Can I tell you, that is one of the, the dynamics and the powers of what happens when we worship. When we begin to behold the beauty of Jesus, we begin to be conformed into his son. We begin to look like him. We begin to glow like our father. And so here it is, I'm learning these things, and all of a sudden, how many know that when you have a mom, especially a praying mom, who's full of the Holy Ghost, you can't get away with nothing? It's like a blessing and a curse. And my mom would say, Justin, if you don't tell me, the Holy Ghost is going to tell me. I said, my gosh, I'm stuck. Lord, why did you let me be born in this house? And so here it is. I'm in a household and my mom is praying for me all the time. I can't get away from anything. And so one day I'm in Virginia on my way to New York and my mother calls my phone. She says, what are you doing? It's almost like moms have a sixth sense or something. She says, I just, I just picked you up in my spirit. What you doing? I said, well, mom, I'm getting ready to go to New York. It's 4th of July weekend. She said, don't go. The Holy Ghost just, tell me, just told me to tell you, don't go. And I say, what? You know, my mind is already in New York. What are you talking about? <laughs> Fordham Street in the Bronx. I used to live in the Bronx. I'm already there. Puerto Rican food. Come on now. She said, Justin, this is what the Lord is telling me to tell you. And so what do I do? I lie to my mother. I say, okay, mom. Yeah, I'm going to stay. I'm not going to go. Hang up the phone. We leave that night to New York. How many know warning comes before destruction? <laughs> Mind you, before this, this, this phone call from my mother, I had three to four people that I don't have direct relationship with. They had dreams about me getting into a car accident. Calling me 3 o'clock in the morning sometimes. Hey, just calling to see if you're okay. I just had a dream about you. And then another person. And then another person. You know, when God is trying to get your attention, he will send you a warning to prepare you for what is getting ready to come. Because when God has a destiny for your life, he is not going to let up until you get into the place and posture that he has for you. Because that's his love. You know, that's why when you really love someone, you're not just going to let them go by the wayside. You know, if you love me, tell me the truth. If you love me, confront me. If you love me, be real with me. Some of our problems is we have people in our lives that don't tell us the truth. Amen. We got people in our lives that just tell us yes all the time or what we want to hear. But we need some people to say, no, you were wrong. Yeah. You need to apologize. Amen. What are you working on? People that push us into our greater destiny. Come on now. Amen. People that allow us to excel in the things of God. The Bible says uh, um, that... Evil communication corrupts good manner. I used to say this. Birds of a feather flock together. Who are you hanging around? Who is in your space? I was just sharing with Kenny this. I said, when God wants to bless you, he adds people to your life. When God wants to protect you, he subtracts people from your life. When you are moving into a new season, God will bring new people in your life. And I want to tell you, church, it's a new season in your life. Amen. The old has gone. And the new has come. 
Do you know what happens when you get into a new season? You know, naturally speaking, when seasons change, there are certain things that you have to do to adjust to the season. For instance, when the weather changes, you cannot be in the wintertime still wearing shorts and a tank top. Why? Because you are out of dress for the season. You can't be doing certain things that that season does not allow you to do. Why? Because you're not in connection with the season that God has for you. And I want to tell you, whatever season that God has you in, you need to know what that season is. And you need to do what is required in that season because no season is the same. Amen. Your purpose will never change. Everyone say that. Your purpose never changes but your function will. What does that mean? That means that if I'm called to, to impact the basketball world in sports, that will never change. That's my purpose. But in one season, I'm a player. Maybe in the next season, I'm a coach. Maybe in the next season, I'm a mentor. So you have to discover what season that God has you in and what you should be doing in that season. Because you have a lot of people, they have no idea what they should be doing. And they're still doing the same thing they did in the same season 20 years ago. That's why I thank God for leaders that push you to discover things in God. They won't allow you to stay where you are. Are you guys hearing what I'm saying? So let me get back to this because I started moving in my testimony and I'll share it at the end when we get to the altar call. But let's get back to this. Everyone say first experiences are important. So the Bible says to put the kingdom of God first. You guys are familiar with this. Matthew 633. It declares seek ye what first the kingdom of God and what his righteousness and what's going to happen. All of these things shall be added unto you. Can I tell you why it's important to seek the kingdom first? Why does God initiate that particular sermon on the mound talking about putting the kingdom first? When you put the kingdom first, what happens is balance begins to come in your life. When you don't put the kingdom first, your life is like this. But when the kingdom is first, what happens? Boom, balance just came in your life. Amen. Stability just came in your life. Why? Because you're putting the most important thing first. Everyone say, first things first. first, things first. So now, the Bible says, Matthew 16, 24, if anyone desires to follow me, they must first deny themselves. Yeah. Uh-oh, we're talking about self-denial now. Nobody wants to hear this type of preaching. Why? Because it requires you to give up something. It requires you to disrupt your comfort. It requires you to move out of your comfort zone. Matthew 6, 24, he says, listen, if you're going to follow me, this is Jesus talking. The first thing that you have to do is you have to deny yourself. And then after denying yourself, you got to take your cross. And then after you take your cross, then you can follow me. Now, when you think about this, that in the Greek translation, when he says, take up your cross, it's actually translating in going the same road as Jesus went. Right. Not walking behind him, not walking in front of him, but walking the same road that Jesus walked as a humble servant, seeking only to be a blessing to people, as a humble servant, healing those who were sick and oppressed by the devil book of acts as a humble servant administering the spirit of god that was on him living a life of selflessness it was never about him come on look at the person next to you say i know you look good but it's not about you the kingdom of god is always about others I'm going to say that again. The kingdom of God is always about others. Even in your pain, it ain't about you. 
even when you're going through on your best day, it ain't about you. Come on, every blessing that comes in your life, there is a revelation connected to that blessing that will always allow you to be a blessing to someone. The moment that we begin to get our eyes on ourselves, what happens? The flow stops. Because God created everything to be like a river, not like a swamp. And who say this in giving, if God can get it through you, he can get it to you. But many of us, if God dropped $10,000 on us right now, we wouldn't see you in church no more. You're going to pay all your bills. What, what happened to Sister Judy? She, she was here last Sunday. What's going on? Judy done took a, an extended vacation. She done got some money and she out. But how about God drops 10 grand on you? You say, Lord, okay, what is it that you desire me to do with this? Lord, how can I be a blessing to someone? See, the problem with us, God brings things to us and we eat it up. We go buy something we don't have no, no business buying. We do things that we shouldn't do outside of our budget. Now, now, now Jesus, if it was him, let me tell you this, guys. The Lord gave me this revelation. Money is only good for one thing. It's good for souls. Because we can't take any of this with us. Cars, houses, come on, Bentley, mansions, all these things. And all it's just boxes, beautiful boxes. We sleep in the box. We drive in the box. We work in the box. Some of you do. We're going to die in the box. But the thing that you can take with you is the lives that you touched. Amen. How many people were inspired Amen. because of what you've done? How many people were lifted up as a time of you encouraged them? How many times, listen, I'd rather have $10 in my pocket and have influence than to have $10 million in my pocket and be bankrupt spiritually in relationships. Amen. You're rich, but you lonely. Yes. You're rich, but you don't have no friends. You're rich, but nobody want to be around you. Because you don't have the heart of the kingdom, which is always about people. That's the way God designed it. Come on, everyone say the kingdom was about others. In Acts chapter 1, before Jesus ascended up, he began to have a conversation with the disciples. And he began to tell the disciples, he says, guys, I'm getting ready to go back to heaven. And I need you guys to do this thing. And before you preach, before you minister, before you prophesy, before you do miracles, I need you to get baptized by the Holy Ghost. Right. Acts chapter 1, Acts chapter 2, we know it as the upper room experience. It is the beginning of the church. It is the birth of the church, Acts chapter 1, where Jesus tells them that they shall be endued with power from on high. They shall be witnesses in Sumeria and Judea and the other uttermost parts of the earth. He was basically telling them that they were going to be pretty much martyred <laughs> because that Greek word witnesses is, is translated martyred. That's why you see some of the, the disciples, they were beheaded. Some of them were stoned. They were martyrs for Christ. Come on, can I tell you, if you really love something, you're willing to die for it. How many of us, if someone came in here with a gun and they told us to renounce our faith, would you renounce your faith with a gun in your face? Or do you love Jesus so much that you're content, that you are not willing to compromise your faith because you're in an uncomfortable situation? Do you love God that much? Is the love of Jesus in your heart that much? Were you willing to go outside of yourself to prove your love for him? See, you know, a lot of us, we talk. But the reality is, where is the fruit in our life? John 15, if you abide in me and I in you, he says, I am the true vine. You are the branches. Apart from me, you can do nothing. John 15, can I tell you, part of bearing fruit, which is what Jesus desires from your life, is connected to the prayers that you pray. A lot of times, some of the prayers are not getting answered in our life because it's not connected to wanting to bear more fruit. Yes, sir. We're praying for things, but we're not praying, Lord, give me more love. Give me more fruit of the Spirit in my life. Lord, let me win and touch more people. God says, I like those prayers. I, I need to get you more resources. 
I need to put you in more positions to where you're winning versus other things that we're praying that's not connected to bearing fruit. I always say this. God is not a respect of persons, but he is a respect of purpose. Meaning what God invested inside of you, he wants a return on it. What are you doing with what God has given you? Lord, I don't have no gifts. Lord, you know, I'm not good like her. God said, I gave you something. You need to take time to discover that so you can actually walk out what it is that God put inside of you. Can I tell you, that's where your prosperity is? Lord, when you going to bless me? When you start obeying. Lord, when it's going to be my time, I'm going to get my blessing. Well, when you start obeying, that blessing going to come. But until then, it's on hold. Because God will not bless what he forbids. And sometimes we try to manipulate God. You know, let me tell you, any time that you try to seek a blessing outside of the original design and what God created you to do, that's an illegal blessing. Illegal. And you got some people, oh, the Lord has blessed me. I got this, and the Lord opened the door, and I got the new car. And then you see the blessing all of a sudden start fading away because it doesn't draw them closer to Jesus. And you wonder, who, where'd that blessing come from? Did you bless yourself, or that really came from God? God is only concerned about you becoming more like Jesus. Come on, what else is more important? This is what we get off because we don't understand when we become like him and have that confession every day. Lord, my only desire is to become more like Jesus today. Then God begins to draw people to himself through you. He begins to send people to give you words. He begins to send people that need to hear your voice and hear what God has done in your life and hear what what is happening in your space. Some of us, we are ashamed of our story. But can I tell you, your story is what's going to bring God glory. And you have to share what God has done in your life. Well, you know, the Lord did that over 30 years ago. That's not it's no longer relevant. Let me give you a checkup from the neck up, okay? Anything that God delivered you from that you cannot deliver yourself is always relevant. People say, you see my glory, but you don't know my story. Listen, when people really understand the reason why you praise God the way you praise him, the reason why you give him a shout while you shout, the reason why you dance and the tone of your voice when you begin to express your love to him, if they only knew the back story. My God, we need to learn how to celebrate those who have survived certain things that the enemy could have taken them out. We want to look at him. Oh, it don't take all that, man. Here, 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 John go. Here we go again. He about to cry. Here he, is, is, here he come. Y'all ready? How about you get with John? Yeah, John, praise him. Yeah, John, we worship. Oh, Lord, we, we get with him. Come on. We have to learn how to get with those that the Holy Spirit may be moving through and not be so judgmental. Imagine, hallelujah, if everyone came on one accord every Sunday. Imagine if the glory of God would manifest because this one and that one, they're all focused on one thing. And this one is going and that's going on. And there's a collective movement happening. And heaven now is responding because they see the unification. They see the love. They see the focus. Where people don't want to go home. Where people are not looking at their clocks when we're going to get out. The game going to be on. People wondering what to do next. How about my love and my heart has been touched. Can we stay in this moment? Come on, that's how you know you're in the spirit. It's because you begin to dwell in a place and you don't want to leave. And until you get in that place, come on, you need to keep on singing them songs. Because sometimes we sing it because we believe it, but sometimes we have to sing it until we believe it. Come on, y'all keep singing. No, don't stop. Sing. Our spirit is not there yet. 
Come on, that's the way those old mothers taught us. Because when the spirit is in it, then the anointing comes. And then boom, the rest is history. But we have to learn how to be persevering in the spirit. Come on and say, I will be persevering in the spirit. So everyone say, first things are important. I want to ask you a question. What is first in your heart right now? And who is first in your heart right now? Yeah, I know it's easy. We in church, so it's easy to say that now. But when before you came here, how about Wednesday or Monday when you really had your bearings and it wasn't in a controlled environment? Who and what is first in your life? Is it seeking provision because you have people that are seeking money? Oh, man, I got to make this money. Come on now. Every time you talk, I'm trying to, I'm on the ground. I got to make this money. Is it relationships? Oh, man, I need to give me a man. I need to give me a woman. I need somebody in my life. Is it clothes? Is it cars? Is it a new job? All these things are external, temporary things, the Bible calls them have no eternal value, but yet we live in a delusional world to think that we need to pursue these things to add value to our life. Let me tell you, you are already valuable. When Christ died for you, that's your value. When he paid the price to redeem you from the, from the, the, the curse of sin, he deems you valuable. There's nothing that you can do or can't do to change that value. It's like your righteousness. The Bible says, he who knew no sin became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God. Right. Meaning.